Hi, welcome to this series of lectures on electrical machines. And here, this video lecture is on synchronous machines. And the main focus here will be on alternators. Why? Because learning alternators makes learning synchronous motors simple. So, first let's consider the contents of this video on alternators and then the detailed description of each content and then we can go for contents of synchronous motors and the description. So, here are the contents of this video on alternators. Introduction. This is actually for the beginners. From this what you will see is classification of machines and what is an alternator, how energy is generated, principle of operation of alternators, constructional difference between DC machine and AC machine, and difference between synchronous machine and asynchronous machine, frequency equation, Diamond's principle application, and EMF equation. Next, construction. From this, the important parts of the alternators are known, and how the alternators are classified can be known from this topic. Next, harmonics. Here, the important harmonics are discussed and their effects. And next, armature winding. So, the terms associated with armature winding are known here, and how the harmonics can be eliminated can be known from this topic. Next, armature reaction. Here, the effect of armature flux on main flux is studied. Next, production of rotating magnetic field and top. So, how rotating magnetic field is produced and how top is produced can be known from this topic. Next, characteristics. Here, the important characteristics of alternates are studied like open circuit characteristics, short circuit characteristics, etc. Next, voltage radiation. So, here, the Causes for voltage drops are known first and what is voltage regulation and what are the different methods to find out voltage regulation are known from this topic. Next, two reaction theory. So, what is two reaction theory and how it is useful for modeling the salient pole type of alternator will be discussed here. Next, slip test. So, how to find the salience of salient pole type of alternator will be studied from this topic. Next, short circuit ratio and synchronizing power coefficient. What is short circuit ratio? And what is synchronizing power coefficient and their importance will be studied from this topic. Next, power equations. So, what are the different power equations for the two types of alternators which we are going to be discussed here will be discussed in this topic. Next, power angle curves, torque angle curves will be seen from this topic. Next, synchronizing power. So, what is synchronizing power and how it acts during the case of disturbances will be seen from this topic. This is the beautiful concept which will tell you that by varying the Prime power input Y only active power varies and by varying the excitation Y only reactive power varies. And Y only active power and Y only reactive power can be better understood from the parallel operation of alternators. Next, parallel operation of alternators. This is the important topic of all because here what alternator actually is can be known from this topic. And here the cases like when two alternators operating on parallel, no load condition and loaded conditions study. And when alternator is connected to infinite bus bar on no load condition and loaded conditions also will be studied from this topic. And here the important curves like V and inverted V curves are known from this topic. First, introduction. From this, first let us see classification of electrical machines. And here I am not going for broad classification, but a simple classification which leads to alternators. So electrical machines are classified as AC machines and DC machines. And AC machines are classified as synchronous machines and asynchronous machines. And synchronous machines as alternators and synchronous motors. So this is our focus, alternators. And let's know what does synchronous machines and asynchronous machines mean. And the speed ns is given by 120 f by p, where p is number of poles and f is frequency. If a machine runs at this speed, then that particular machine is called as synchronous machine. 
and if a machine runs other than this speed, then that machine is called as asynchronous machine. So asynchronous machines examples are induction generators which run at more than synchronous speed and induction motors which run at less than synchronous speed. Whereas synchronous machines, alternators and synchronous motors which run at synchronous speed. Now let's see what is an alternator. We have seen here that alternator is a synchronous machine which converts mechanical energy input to electrical energy output with the help of DC excitation. Simply alternator is an AC generator. All your home electrical appliances and industrial machines, everything needs AC electrical energy as their input for their functioning. And uh, of course there are DC applications too, but DC applications are very limited. So most of the machines needs AC electrical energy as their input for their functioning. Next, how energy is generated in power plants. Obviously we know that in power plants alternators are employed for the generation of electrical energy and that generated electrical energy is stepped up to hundreds of kilovolts and then transmitted and distributed through transmission lines and distribution lines over thousands of kilometers to the consumers. Consumers may be houses or domestic applications or industries. Okay. So here comes the question of the importance of electrical energy. So why there is necessity to convert other forms of energy available in nature into electrical energy. So here comes the answer that Electrical energy is the only energy which can be easily controlled and which can be transmitted over longer distances. So is why whatever the energy available in nature is converted into electrical energy in the power plants. And what happens in thermal power plants means by burning the coal, okay, that heat energy generated is converted into electrical energy. Whereas in tidal power plants, the energy stored in water in the form of potential energy is converted into electrical energy. And remember one point that electrical energy is neither available directly in nature nor used in its final form. And because of that importance of electrical energy, so is why that whatever the energy is available in nature is converted into electrical energy in power plants by alternators. Next, principle of operation of alternators. So the principle of operation of alternators is Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction principle. So let's see what does it says. When a moving conductor cuts a steady magnetic field and EMF is induced in that conductor and the other way is when a rotating or alternating okay, when a rotating or varying magnetic field that's a steady conductor and EMF is induced in that conductor By observing these two statements, what you have to note that in order to get EMF induced in the conductor, 
either conductor must be in motion or magnetic field must be in motion and the EMF induced from this case is called as dynamic EMF because here conductor is in moving state and the EMF induced from the second case is called static EMF one means here conductor is in static position and these statements comes under Faraday's first law and Faraday's second law gives you the EMF equation E is equal to n d phi by dt where n is number of conductors and phi is flux and minus sign is given by Lenz law Lenz law simply says that the effect opposes the cause produced it from the Faraday's law we have known that how EMF is induced in the conductor and minus sign is given by Lenz law and the direction of induced EMF can be found by applying Fleming's right hand rule also called as generator rule now let's see what Fleming's right hand rule says stretch your right hand thumb index and your middle finger perpendicular to each other the direction of thumb will indicate the direction of force or motion and index finger will indicate the direction of magnetic field and middle finger will indicate the direction of induced EMF or current so Fleming's right hand rule is used to find the direction of induced EMF if the directions of magnetic field and force direction are known Now let's analyze Faraday's law and Fleming's right hand rule. Consider magnetic field by North Pole and South Pole. As you know that the direction of magnetic field is from North to South. And consider a conductor of effective length L. Effective length means the portion of conductor under the influence of magnetic field and let us suppose the conductor is moving along this direction like it has moved a distance of dx then the flux linkages change in flux okay is given by flux density into area swept by the conductor so d into area swept by the conductor is length l into dx and from the Faraday's law what we know is e is equal to n d phi by dt and we know that here conductor we took is single conductor so n is 1 that is equal to d phi by dt since n is equal to 1 now place this d phi in this that implies e is equal to d into l dx by dt and here dx by dt is velocity if the conductor makes an angle theta with the magnetic field then thank you. e is equal to blv sin theta consider a magnetic field north pole and south pole okay. and direction of field is north to south obviously and consider a coil plane perpendicular to the direction of field a coil is a combination of two conductors with the end connections so let this be conductor AB and let this be conductor C and here I am drawing the EMF waveform which is induced in the conductor AB okay and uh, now by applying Fleming's right hand rule let's find the direction of induced EMF in the conductor AB let us suppose this coil is moving in clockwise direction so the force on conductor AB will be towards down so now apply Fleming's right hand rule point your index finger along the 
field and uh, thumb along the direction of motion then obviously the direction of induced emf will be given by the direction of your middle finger so by applying Fleming's right hand rule it is found that the direction of induced emf is from b to a now consider the coil rotation for 90 degrees in the same direction then the plane of coil will be parallel to the direction of field so in this case if you observe the flux linking with the coil are minimum but change is maximum so as change is maximum emf is maximum so from 0 to 90 degrees of rotation the emf is increasing because change is increasing and now consider further 90 degrees of rotation now the plane of coil will be perpendicular to the field and conductor AB will be now down and CD will be up if you observe here from this case to this case as coil moves further 90 degrees here flux linking with the coil is increasing but change is decreasing so EMF will decrease from 0 to 90 degrees okay so from 0 to 180 degrees this is the nature of EMF in conductor AB now after 180 degrees of rotation now apply again Fleming's right hand rule to find the direction of induced EMF in conductor AB so after 180 degrees of rotation okay force on conductor AB will be in this direction upwards so point your index finger along the field direction and uh, thumb along the direction of force now the middle finger direction will indicate the direction of induced EMF so by applying Fleming's right hand rule it is found that the direction of induced EMF is now from A to B initially it is from B to A and after 180 degrees of rotation induced EMF direction is from A to B means after 180 degrees rotation the direction of induced EMF has changed okay now consider further 90 degrees of rotation along the same direction so now plane of coil will be parallel to the field and from this position to this position as coil moves okay for the 90 degrees means the flux linking with the coil is decreasing but change is increasing so emf will increase but emf will increase in reverse direction because induced emf has changed after 180 degrees of rotation so will increase in this direction okay now consider further 90 degrees of rotation now again plane of coil will be perpendicular to the field and from this position to this position as coil moves along the same direction the flux linking with the coil is increasing but change is decreasing so emf will decrease in reverse direction so decrease like this and this periodical change of induced emf is called ac from this what are the two points to be noted are here the nature of induced emf okay we are discussing the dynamic emf case the nature of induced emf is ac and the other point to be remembered is if the plane of coil lies along the interpolar axis then the induced emf is minimum if the plane of coil lies along the polar axis then the induced emf is maximum okay so these are the two important points to be noted this concept comes under simple loop generator concept now let's move to the constructional difference between dc machine and ac machine as we know that dc machine construction consists of the important parts like stator which is a fixed part and rotor which is a moving part and in this stator is used for holding the poles and rotor is used for housing the 
conductors means armature winding is placed on the rotor which is in moving part and from the analysis of Faraday's law and uh, Fleming's right hand rule what we have found that the nature of induced EMF is AC for DC machine we need DC output whereas the nature of induced EMF is AC so in order to get DC output in this construction split pins are used So, split prints does the rectifying action, means they convert AC to DC. And whereas to connect the EMF as it is, then slip prints are used. But remember that for AC output, this type of construction is not employed. Why? Because consider this type of construction. Stator, which is a fixed part, and rotor, which is a moving part, and here the conductors are placed in the slots of stator, a fixed part. Whereas conductors are placed on the rotor here, which is a moving part. So from this, you can directly observe that collection of induced EMF from the fixed part is easier when compared with collection of induced EMF from the moving part. The other important difference is here. Here for the field excitation, this machine needs DC input and this DC input must be given to this moving part to the slip rings. So here slip rings are used and in this construction also slip rings are used. But the difference is here. Here the slip rings are directly connected to the induced EMF which are of higher values. So higher rating slip rings are to be used. Whereas here the DC excitation required is very low values. So low rating slip rings are sufficient here. So for AC output this type of construction is preferred because it is having the two major advantages that is collection of induced EMF directly from the static part and slip rings of lower ratings can be used in this type of construction. So is why this type of construction for AC output is not preferred. Okay? Whereas this type of construction is only preferred for DC output. Next difference between synchronous machines and asynchronous machines. As we know that synchronous machines runs at constant speed ms whereas asynchronous machines rotates at speed other than ns and from this the important point to be noted is as these machines running at constant speed the generated energy will have constant frequency whereas here variable frequency so the importance of having constant frequency is in order to have better understanding between generating stations and consumers okay standardization of frequency is essential and to operate alternators in parallel constant frequency is the important parameter to be followed means the alternators having same frequency can be connected to the grid means they can be run in parallel and next important point here is real power and reactive power are generated whereas here only real power is generated by absorbing reactive power and from this the important point to be noted is as all the loads are of inductive nature, they need both real power and reactive power for their functioning. So if the power generation is only by asynchronous machines, then that load requirement can't be met because loads require both real power and reactive power. Whereas asynchronous machines generates only real power. 
So that load requirement can be met by synchronous machines because they generate both real power and reactive power. And from this, the other point to be noted is reactive power can be delivered or absorbed. By varying the excitation, we can make reactive power deliver or absorb. And here Q is absorbed. And the other difference voltage and frequency can be controlled. Whereas here to control V and F. need converters so from this the discussion is here so what is the necessity of controlling voltage and frequency okay so voltage and frequency stability are utmost essential for the smooth functioning of your loads so here it comes the necessity to control the voltage levels and frequency levels and for voltage stability reactive power supply must be equal to the reactive power demand and for frequency stability active power generation must be equal to the active power demand so in case of synchronous machines both voltage and frequency can be controlled simply by means for to control voltage simply excitation of the synchronous machines are varied so that reactive power varies and so that voltage can be varied and for to vary the frequency tantal input power to the synchronous machines are varied so that frequency can be varied so simply by varying the mechanical power input and excitation voltages and frequency can be controlled whereas here to control they need converters so these are the major differences between synchronous machines and asynchronous machines. Now let's move to the frequency equation. For one rotation, P by 2 cycles are produced. We have seen that from the analysis part of Faraday's law and Fleming's right hand rule. For one rotation, P by 2 cycles are produced. So for n rotations, where n is in rotations per minute, P by 2 into n cycles per minute are produced. So cycles per minute. And now I'm converting minute to in seconds. That implies P by 2 into n by 60 cycles per second. That implies F is equal to P n by 120 cycles per second. That implies F is equal to P n by 120 pages. Okay, next let's move to the Diambert principle application. Diambert principle is the basic and fundamental law of motions. And by applying this to generator, we will get the torque balance equations. So, alternator input from prime over, which gives prime over torque. And uh, let us suppose the voltage current by ammeter and voltage measured by voltmeter let this be rest to load so when prime board input is given to the alternator then electromagnetic torque will act in opposite to the prime board and the other two torques which acts in opposite direction to the prime board torque core torque due to moment of connection torque due to friction coefficient so that implies prime board torque is equal to Torque due to moment of inertia plus torque due to friction coefficient and electromagnetic torque. So at steady state,
angular velocity that we do means omega is constant. That implies du w by dt is equal to zero. That implies angular velocity omega is equal to t prime over minus t electromagnetic by b. So from this what you have to note is as load increases, okay, as the load on the alternator increases, electromagnetic torque increases. So the difference will decrease. If the difference decreases, speed decreases. Alternators must turn at synchronous speed, means constant speed. So in order to maintain constant speed, prime over torque must be increased. Next, multiplying omega on both sides of this equation, that implies So this is mechanical power input and this is power loss and this is electrical power output and here the electrical power output as we took a rest to load so V into I. So this can be equated to V into I that implies electrical power output is equal to T EM into omega that is equal to V into I. And now by applying the Ampere's principle to motor. So the input voltage V is equal to armature distance drop plus vacuum of EB. And multiplying both sides with IA. That implies Electrical power input is equal to power loss plus mechanical power output. So from this, Pmec is equal to Eb into Ia. So Eb into Ia is called the electrical equivalent of mechanical power output. Next EMF equation. Flux is of cosine nature. So consider flux side and having maximum value of phi. So flux side is equal to phi into cos omega t. And according to Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, we have E is equal to minus n d phi by dt. And here I took flux as psi. So consider d psi by dt. And I am now deriving the EMF equation for alternator. So here I am representing N with T. Where T represents the number of terms per phase. So now place this in this. So V phi cos omega t by dt and differentiation of cosine function is minus sine function so minus into minus omega phi sine omega t that implies t omega phi sine omega t whereas angular velocity omega can be represented by 2 pi f so t into 2 pi f into phi sine omega t and this is the average EMF and in order to consider the RMS then divide this by root 2 that implies E RMS is equal to so 2 by root 2 is root 2 root 2 phi f t sine omega t so root 2 into phi is 4.44 that implies E RMS is equal to 4.44 pi F T sine omega T. This is the EMF equation for concentrated and 
full pitch winding. So what is concentrated and what is full pitch winding let us discuss in the next topic of armature winding and 4.44 pi ft can be represented as v max where v max is equal to 4.44 pi ft and now I am representing sine function in terms of cosine function. Now, if you observe here that induced CMF lags behind the flux by 90 degrees. So, if flux is in this direction, then induced CMF will be in this direction. So this is the convention which we will use in phasor diagrams. So please remember that.